there's a really cool method you can use to make your API routes, for example, in Next.js super fast. I'm currently using this on the software as a service I'm building for Next.js AB testing and it managed to cut the API response time almost in half. Let's take a detailed look at the results and how you can use the same method for your apps. So the summary is I increased my API response speed by 35%, which is a pretty big deal. Now what surprised me was that the Vercel Edge was actually slower than the Vercel Not Edge. We're gonna look at that later. First off, let's see a very simple example on how to achieve the 35% speed increase because that's pretty nice. Let's take a look at one of the most simple examples and that is this right here. We await three Redis calls in this API route and that's it. And each time we are just incrementing something called example. So here example will be one, after executing this example will be two, and after executing the third one, it will be three, of course. Now you might be saying, Josh, this example is pretty horrible because after all, we could just increment by three and just don't do the other calls and there we go that's our performance optimization and you'd be right in this example but there's a lot more complex use cases for the same principle i'm going to show you but you don't need to think yourself into the whole api logic um, where I actually did this in production. And also this example starts to become a bit more, you know, it makes a bit more sense once we introduce conditionals, because if we just conditionally want to increment the two, I mean, in this case, it's always true, but imagine this was some conditional, then we couldn't just always increment by three. There would be a conditional. And just in that case, if we had two increments just like this, we couldn't do both at the same time. We would have to await the first one, check the conditional, and then do the second one, right? Well, kind of, but it depends. To understand this, let's look at the request and response lifecycle. Let's zoom in a bit and let's see how this works. So we have two sides, right? We have the client side, and we have the server side. The client, not to confuse you, could actually be our API route. This does not mean it has to be the browser, but we just want to differentiate between our machine and the Redis instance. So actually let's call this API and let's call this Redis. When we make the first call from our API to Redis, we are essentially telling Redis, hey, increment this value. Let's give this a name, increment, and we are telling Redis increment this certain example value and then Redis sends us back a response as an integer like zero or one if the operation was successful. Let's just assume the operation was successful so we get that back in our API. And we can see how that looks if we just save this to a constant like res for example that is gonna be the integer of whether this operation was successful or not. And if we do the second request, well, the same thing happens. The main problem is that these two calls happen in a blocking way. That means let's just assume, I know this is kind of over the top, but let's just assume each of these took 500 milliseconds for the request and response lifecycle. That means even if the Redis server could handle a thousand or a hundred thousand requests per second, that is more realistic, in this case, it could only handle two because these are blocking each other. That is called a RTT, a round trip time, and our goal is to decrease this round trip time to optimize our performance. And the way we can do that is through something called Redis pipelining. And before we get into the code for that, let me show you what it does on a conceptual level. Essentially, we can do this. We can move these calls down here and this call up here. So instead of making two requests, essentially this just counts as one request. We do not need to wait for the response of this first call, but instead we are also directly making the second call and do both calls at once and then only get one answer. So essentially we have just cut the RTT, the round trip time in half. And what Redis does is it receives command one, stores it in memory and then command two. So it has an internal queue of how these commands are processed and then sent back to us. So not only does this reduce latency, but it also allows us to do way more commands per second on our Redis server. And implementing this is surprisingly easy. Let's call something a Redis pipeline, just save that as a const, and that is going to be a Redis dot pipeline. Now I'm using Upstash for this. This is not sponsored, but most Redis providers offer this functionality. This is not Upstash specific. And with this pipeline, what we can do is let's not await the call, but let's bundle these two calls together by just replacing the await redis.increment with the redis pipeline 
dot increment. If we hover over this, we can see, okay, the type has changed. It's a bit weird now, but since we are bundling these, we can get rid of the const response. We don't need to save that right now. And also we are gonna replace this one. Now you might have noticed, technically, this is not an async operation anymore. Never are we awaiting anything. This is completely synchronous because the Redis pipeline actually never get executed. To execute the Redis pipeline, what we want to do at the very bottom is the await redis pipeline.exec. So to actually tell our server, hey, send all these bundled requests, in our case this and this at the same time, just right here as the blue box, and then we'll get back the responses. Again, this was a very simple example, but make sure to use this in your app because it drastically improves performance. And there is real life application. I've used this in my API route with the Redis pipeline right here. There's a bit more involved logic in this API route. That's why I figured you probably don't want to think yourself into this. But the use case here is we are incrementing a hash. We're also initializing a hash with values of zero if they don't exist and X not exists. And lastly, we have a conditional Redis pipeline dot set where we set a simple key value pair. And just like that, we achieved a 35% increase on the API route speed, which is pretty nuts if you ask me. Again, one thing that confused me is that the Vercel Edge tends to perform worse than the not edge. So if I took out of this real world use case, the export const runtime edge, then the API route was actually faster. Now, why is the Vercel edge slower? Let's take in my initial understanding of what might be the problem. A user makes a request to our API endpoint. Let's make this a bit less sloppy, there we go. And our API endpoint then in turn needs to make a request to our database, at least in my use case, and it's a very common use case. Normally an API makes a request to our database. And the database then fetches some data, returns it back to the API, which the API returns to the user back. Now the main problem with the Vercel Edge, what I first figured is the placement. If the user is in Germany, for example, then the Vercel API hosted on the Edge runtime will also execute in Germany and Frankfurt because that is a Vercel Edge location and it is closest to the user. That's the main benefit of the Edge. It's physically close to the user. But now imagine if the database was somewhere in the USA, for example, in the US East region. This distance right here is so much more important than this distance right here. Because in the API example, oftentimes you have multiple calls and the data transferred is pretty large. The data transfer between the user and the API is usually pretty small because you're working with a client and don't want to completely bust the network requests with 10 megabytes each request, right? But these data transfers right here between API and database are typically much larger. That means the distance between the API and the database is much more important than the distance between your user and the API. If the API is executed in Germany and the database is in the USA, there's a lot of physical distance between them, making the request be very long. However, that's not really the use case for me. This database is also hosted in Germany for data privacy reasons with read replicas in the US East and US West. But it also means that the database is already very close to the user. In my case, me, the API is executed in Germany and the database is also also in Germany. So technically, the Vercel Edge should be really fast in this scenario, but it isn't. Now, it's not really slow either, right? The after performance improvements with the Redis pipelining, on average, we have about 250 milliseconds of API response times, whereas with the Edge, we have about 288, 290, so about 40 milliseconds more. That is not a huge deal, especially if you compare the before Redis pipelining right here on the edge and not on the edge to the after Redis pipelining with a 25% speed increase on the edge and a 34% speed increase on the not edge, on the regular Node.js runtime. Okay, so to be honest, I'm not 100% sure. This was my first guess as to how this might occur, but to be honest, I'm not super sure why the edge is a bit slower. Maybe it was just because of the small sample size. I only did 10 tests for each and that's not a lot. You could automate this to run 100, 1000, 10,000 tests for each and maybe then the results would be statistically significant so you could draw conclusions from them. So I'm not saying the Vercel edge is bad in any way. I'm just saying in my specific test case right here, I was very surprised that it was in fact a bit slower. If you have any guesses as to why, I would love if you comment them down below and then I'll see you in the next video. I really really hope you enjoyed this one. I'll see you in the next one. Have a good one and bye bye.